members, um, I'll declare this, this meeting of the committee open as we have a quorum. We're going to have silence, please, councillors. I advise that these, this meeting of the committee will be streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and a recording will also be published to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken and this means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the council, including transferring outside of Australia. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you back to our first meeting back in person, following our remote meetings of the last few months using Zoom. We have, meaning the City of Adelaide, has completed the required COVID safe plan and note that our room capacity for the Colonel Light Room is 48 people in total, but with only six members of the public in the gallery. Uh, this is as we can ensure we are appropriately socially distanced. The streaming therefore provides for the best way for the public to watch our proceedings. We have used our best endeavours uh, to get this social distancing measure between councillors and staff, which isn't always achievable around this table setting, um, but it is uh, nevertheless the case in the gallery. Exactly the same as. Item one Council acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to their elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present with us. Apologies and leave of absence. I have one apology from the Lord Mayor, and it seems that we're all otherwise accounted for. Confirmation of the minutes. I'll seek a mover and a seconder to confirm that these are true and accurate. Councillor Ho, Councillor Noel, any discussion? Put that to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Um, unless there are any objections, I'll actually bring 4.9, which is the Brown and Keswick Creek report, uh, to the uh, front of the agenda, and we'll hear that now. Thank you. Welcome back. Um, uh, members, we're going to take this as read. Are there any uh, questions or comments to be made on this report? I think it's all fairly straightforward. No? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Members, we now move on to 4.1, which is the Adelaide Parklands uh, Building Design Guidelines. Uh, and we'll welcome Chris to the front. Thank you, Chris. We'll open it up and I'll go to Councillor Simpson. Thanks, Chair. How nice to see everybody in person. I've missed you all. Um, my um, question relates to uh, stakeholder engagement. Thank you for the report. Um, but I noticed that there's been, a, I guess I would suggest, a fairly small uh, number of stakeholders um, who have engaged. Only five responses from uh, focus stakeholders, 12 individual responses from the community and only three community group responses. I mean, is that typical for a piece of work like this and do you have a view on why there are so few stakeholders that have engaged? Uh, through the chair, thank you for your question, Councillor. The focused stakeholder was larger groups, representative groups, ODASA, uh, the Institute of Architects, the Institute of Landscape Architects, so it wasn't just individual people reviewing from them, they actually put it out to a number of people and had workshops to review. So the feedback from them was very substantial. And it was also very valuable because ultimately the guidelines will be used by the design profession to um, design and present buildings for the parklands. So it was very valuable to get their feedback. On the community feedback, which happened in February through the Yorsay Adelaide page, there are actually 169 visits to the Yorsay page. Of those, 74 were what are called informed visitors. So they're ones that downloaded documents and had a look through them. Yes. And then there were 12 engaged visitors, ones that actually put forward feedback or responses. So that can be interpreted. The majority of people that view the guidelines were actually supportive and satisfied with the content. I guess another interpretation could be that they had difficulty with the Your Say uh, website. And I have had that feedback before from members of the community in relation to the Crows. Um, 
consultation. And so I guess I just wanted to reiterate that some feedback for admin that, you know, I'd be really keen for us to look at what we can do to improve community engagement with these sorts of things. It's not a criticism of the work that you've done or this project at all. It's a broader um, question around, I just feel we have to maybe move beyond the, the Orsa website because um, it strikes me that we get a few uh, pieces of work coming back where there's actually limited input. So um, yeah, I'd be very keen to look at if there's other ways we can engage. But thank you. Thank you, Council Service Members. Councillor Mark. Um, yes, look, I, um, well, there we go, it's about so long since I pressed it. Um, yeah, look, I, I echo those sentiments. Uh, and in fact, um, it was the subject of a, uh, a report in Adelaide a Review newspaper in which it was observed that of the 12 respondents, five said they were not easy to navigate that is the your say analysis uh, and understand six of the 12 didn't agree with guiding principles five didn't believe that the guidelines would deliver quality fit for purpose buildings five considered the footprint was the most important issue um, and so it's a very small sample um, and what worries me is it's such an important document because um, as members would understand this is going to form a part of the statutory documents and policies that uh, developers are required to meet in order to have their development approved by CAP or SCAP as it may be. And um, it's equally important because there is a perception that this document is not sufficiently prescriptive, that it is ambiguous, that it is silent on footprint, it, it is uh, silent on total floor space, it is silent on height, um, to the extent that I think the, uh, the review story noted one particularly ambiguous two section says, quote, heights and forms must be informed by their context. Um, so here you have a document that is extremely open to interpretation, which will be cited by developers, um, that is the ambiguity, to assist them in having their proposals approved. Um, and so uh, people ought to be aware of, of what this document does and, uh, and how it's going to interact with other bits of policy uh, and, and indeed the, the new planning and development code. Um, I think it's just unfortunate that it's had so, so little visibility. And I do think uh, that the absence of prescription on issues of that nature is a problem. Uh, and I, I certainly would like to make it known that when it comes to council, um, I will be voting against it, not because I think it's a bad idea that we have a policy like this. I think it's a good idea. It's just that I think it needs to be less ambiguous and a bit more certain about what it was. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Just a reminder, we're not meant to foreshadow how we're going to vote. Um, in council, any other questions or comments? Councillor Everton, today. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just very quickly, um, I think this is a, uh, this is a good piece of work. Um, I'd like to remind uh, council members that the guideline is a document that provides guidance. It doesn't necessarily have to prescribe exactly what needs to be done at what size or what height. It's there to, uh, to provide some guidance. So um, um, I actually uh, like the way that it's been written. I uh, uh, like the nature that uh, that's been done in because you're not you're not there to uh, uh, you know to tell designers and architects exactly what needs to be designed. So um, it provides guidance and um, identify it's a it's a guideline. So it does the job. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ibrahim, today. Um, given no one else has jumped in, I was wondering, Chris, um, uh, or CEO, or Clinton, could you just walk us through what Apple's uh, feedback on the um, guidelines were, considering they're our expert and advisory body? You were there. Well, we so you're there. Oh, please. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. Through the chair. Um, so the feedback from Apple was to, on page 10, the guidelines revised by singular and plural references. So, you know, like the guidelines are, the guidelines is, is a series of 
Tableau guidelines or is it a document, you know, similar document? We were to remove the case studies that were in the appendices, um, review and revise the chapter heading why we need this part and get a clarity in the purpose of what that part is actually about. Review the aspiration that removal of temporary structures should have the same level of design integrity as permanent structures to determine whether there is a different way to express the aspiration. Include a green star rating in relation to the sustainability of buildings, which we've done so. Um, and Lord Mayor, so to be sure, on behalf of that, we will write formally to the Minister to advocate for the guidelines and its recognition in the PND code as well as with design standards. Very thorough, thank you. Phil, did you have your hand up yet? No, no, I think he explains what I was saying. It is actually going to be read in the context of the planning and development code, which is why you need more prescription and less uh, of a guideline to do the job. Members? Okay. Thank you, Chris. We can now move on to 4 2 the Field Street upgrade and partial closure. And uh, I'm going to take this one as read um, members and see if, welcome, and see if there are any questions. Councillor Long. Yeah, I'd raised this one a bit earlier, and that's regards to uh, with the fuel street with the one way traffic, and, and that is about uh, one of the, uh, the, you know, the businesses there has a forklift that does need to you know, use that. So that's just to, to, just to make mention that we need to consider that uh, when you know, we're putting this together, that they're able to still unload the trucks, etc., which is the whole purpose of uh, all the loading zones, etc. Um, did we want to elaborate on that point as well and, and perhaps um, uh, mention some of the design elements that were excluded from the final product in favour of the ability to unload and load? Um, uh, thanks, Chair. For that, I'll pass to Dan Keller, who's um, been instrumental in putting the design together. So, Dan, could you just elaborate on the key components and constraints of the design as it currently stands? Sure. So, with Regarding to the loading, we're obviously well aware of the importance of loading in Field Street and obviously the precinct in general. As part of the project, we would be reducing the total number of parking spaces in the street by three, but we would be doubling the number of loading zones from five to ten, which will assist with loading in the street and the precinct. And as for the forklift access in the street, uh, forklifts are classified as motor vehicles, so they will need to abide by the one way direction in the street. Obviously, that um, ensure safety in the street, but with regards to the particular property you're referring to, we work with them through the design phase to ensure that their needs are met, which may include reducing the parking a little bit or, and or extending the no stopping in front of their business so they can get their truck there and load in front of their truck instead of parking in right court to then run the forklifts up the wrong way up Field Street. Excellent. Does that make sense? Yep. Cool. Members, any other points or comments? No, I, I might just say I think it's a wonderful um, uh, design and, and thank you for the work. I think it's going to sort of breathe new life into that um, main way and reclaim some space for pedestrians, slow it down a little bit, and I think we'll see some uh, good businesses sprouting along there because of that. So thank you. We will now go. To four three, the strategic property matter, unnamed private road off Market Street, and we welcome Tom. Thank you, Tom. Members, Councillor Martin. I look, I'm agnostic about this, but a, a couple of questions in the document. It states that there is, and it's unqualified, community benefit that flows from this sale. Now, apart from you know economic uplift and having tall buildings and all of that, what, what specifically is the community benefit? Firstly, by converting the road to a public road and then going through the process as listed, effectively what would then happen is that the proponent would then seek to acquire the road, but would preserve the rights for the community in regards to access egress in perpetuity, and also they're responsible for the maintenance, capital and upkeep of the road. And, and at the moment they have access? At the minute it is a, a private road um, with certain rights of way for certain proponents. It's a poorly maintained road and what they wish to do is enhance that road to support a 19-storey development. 
Yeah, but they have access to the road. They do. They do have access. However, it's not guaranteed access. Okay. What? Why is that not guaranteed? The the reason being is, uh, as you would be aware, councillors, at that times the always be disputes in regards to people who have rights away and that they wish to preserve or they deny people access onto the road. What they're wishing to do is to control that with a level of certainty and we've been working with all the owners to actually make sure that we can actually provide them. And should we therefore be acting on the other 150 private roads to make sure that people have continued access? So uh, what, what I would be saying to you that we are actually working through 130 roads as oh, we speak um, and as you're probably aware that is a very lengthy process. Firstly to understand who owns the road um, naturally we're dealing with a lot of uh, deceased estates and um, you're, you're looking at laneways or roads that are purchased whatever and we're trying to source who they are so we're doing our due diligence with all of those, those roads and reports will be coming back either as a whole or as a as a way when requested by the performance. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor members, any other questions or points? Councillor Moran? Uh, Councillor Council Moran, please the mic. When, oh, that's mine. Uh, when will we be getting that um, report? Because in all my time I've Three percent member, we're working that through. The, the complication at the minute is the due diligence in regards to the searches. So when we're going through the roads, we can name all the roads. We can uh, certainly say what current status. The reality is, it's actually trying to understand who owns what rights. I, mean, I totally understand that because um, often there isn't enough. Yeah. And of the three roads that we're looking into for the last twenty years mm -hmm. in North Adelaide, nothing's moved mm -hmm. on that. Um, there must come a time when you decide there is no owner or you can't find an owner and we move on. But we seem to get stuck at that if we can't find an owner. So what, what is that is, still the case? No, it, it isn't the case because the council has the right to go in. If it gets to a point, it can nominate to declare a private road public, um, and then we'd go through a process. And then it's at that point if you get any objections. However, in saying that, I would be happy to take offline those three roads to understand what they are and see if we can progress those. But in regards to the 130 roads, we're systematically going through. I think that was the Councillor Milani, previous Councillor Milani request to look through that, and we're progressively looking through those roads, hoping to bring back a report. But what we're trying to do is segment it in regards to sections of the city. So North Adelaide is probably going to be the first one we'll come back. Okay, just one more question. Um, in the past, um, it has been that uh, if no one is found and the road is substandard that the people that abut the lane are asked them to spend money to upgrade it to a certain level then the council will take over now that never happens because the people don't want to spend money on something that's not theirs and then we say well we'll only take it when it's a certain level of um, repair is that still the case there's a, a number of things that could play there council can determine whether it wishes to accept a private road Converted into public depending on what conditions. And so we can ask the current owners uh, who normally will almost deny that they have any responsibility because it's normally a deceased person, so they'll put the ownership back to them. They will say, We love the access, but we're not willing to spend any capital. However, we always encourage people to upgrade or look at the conditions of their own private roads. What we would do, it can be a precondition if we wish to transfer from a private to a public. It could be to a certain standard and only then would council accept it. So the quick answer is yes, we don't accept them unless the uh, neighbours. Have we made any laneways public in, in the last 10 years? Uh, three percent memory, yes we have, and I'll come back to in regards to that list. I'm happy to provide. It could be one, ten, twenty? I, 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 I it, it, it's certainly more than one. I don't know if it's more than 20, but I can certainly. I, I suggest it's none. Um, so I'll be very pleased to see that it's um, incorrect. So quickly find it. I, 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to hopefully hope pr prove you wrong, wrong in that one. But anyway, we'll see. You can prove me wrong. Thank you. Members, any other points? No, we will move on. Thank you, Tom. Events, festivals, and sponsorship program funding recommendations for four. Thank you, Jackie. One, two. Yeah. 
right, Councillor Sims and Councillor Mackey. Uh, thanks, um, Chair. Uh, I just want to um, uh, draw members' attention to the fact that I work at um, the University of um, Adelaide, so one of the um, parties affected by this. Um, however, because this is not a decision-making meeting, um, I've been advised that it is appropriate for me to still remain uh, in the room um, during the discussion. Thank you, Rob. Councillor Mackey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in a similar vein and in relation to the same item, I have a connection to the LA Festival of Ideas, which is uh, uh, um, as a subject of 1.4. Same, um, I have sought that advice from uh, Rudy Deco and I appreciate his, uh, his advice. Thank you. Councillor Moran, oh, Rudy, did you want to? Uh, through the presiding member, just for clarity, members indeed, no conflicts of interest are present under the Local Government Act for uh, committee meetings because under the current government structure it is indeed non-decision making. Uh, so therefore in the minutes there will be made no record of such declarations made because they are indeed um, irrelevant for this particular forum, but, but appreciate your presence. <coughs> um, they will of course play at the actual council meeting when they these matters come forward for decision making. I, I would, um, if possible, like it noted in the minutes, just because um, you know there have been questions sometimes raised about this committee, so it's good to just have it noted that we discussed that it wasn't necessary to have a formal. Oh, yeah, that's okay. That. Jane, Thank you. Can you do both councils? Yes. Thank you, sure. Oh, yeah. unless, unless you're uncomfortable with that. We can do that. Um, just from a practicality perspective and from a governance perspective, I don't want to create uh, the practice of um, uh, members feeling um, almost a moral obligation to start declaring conflicts when in fact those provisions don't apply for this particular meeting at which you know it, they get stalled. Okay. So uh, we, we, we know that comment in this particular occasion, but uh, as it's been the case under the current government structure, um, it, it doesn't play. It's not. Okay, oh, that's fine. Needed, um, but, yeah, you know, that's Is it possible to note them as a foreshadowing of the conflict? Yes, we can, council we can do that. Like that. That's yeah. probably better. Yeah, yeah. 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 appreciate yeah. that. Thanks. Yeah. So then it's still there on the record. Um, council Moran, I gave you some leeway earlier to not uh, ruin your vibe with the questions, but I'm going to need you to use the mic. I'm sorry, I'm not going to. Um, uh, Moran, if you're not going to use the mic, I won't allow you to speak. Your, com your contributions need to be recorded. Councillor Moran, you can come down here and sit next to Councillor no, Kouros, no, or everyone can shuffle along one. Uh, or you can sit really next to Councillor Knoll. Uh, Councillor Moran, Councillor Moran, I'm not, not going to allow you to speak without using the microphone. Everyone else in this room has to use a microphone. Everyone in, else in this room is using a microphone. They're following the rules. This is for the benefit of the recording and for the people streaming at home. Obviously, we can't have members of the public in the gallery. Which, Thank you, Councillor Moran. Which standing order says that, Junior? Can I ask Rudy now? Thank you. Um, I don't agree, or I think there's a shadow over the advice you've given in that events and sponsorship program funding will become a, a motion on council to be resolved by a vote. And um, I understand that in mo a lot of committees, such as the Keswick Flood Mitigation, they're, they're not going to become a decision. But this is definitely a decision, decision that will come to council. I would... I wouldn't stay. Um, because I think it gives them a conflict. They are entering the debate. They are influencing the outcome. Uh, but if you can actually sign off on that. Chair, in light of the concerns Councillor Moran has expressed, I think it would be better for us to leave the room. So in an abundance of caution. You are, yeah. Rudy, please, please contribute. You're of course free to leave the room if you wish. And that does get noted in Council's leave room. But Rudy, through the I remember, um, indeed, this matter has been raised before at previous committee meetings. Um, the Local Government Act is very clear that the conflict of interest provisions only come to play for matters for decision by the Council Order Committee. There is no decision sought and there's also no debate uh, allowed under the, the current governance structure. Um, the uh, purpose of this uh, current committee structure is to allow questioning and interrogation of the report presented to you. Uh, to allow a fully informed decision when it does come to council for decision making. So but I can't. Is, 
but I, I take your point that that is not how these committees work. Councillor, your mic. Uh, through the presiding member, I agree to Councillor Moran that indeed in the past uh, the committee uh, was operating under a different governance structure, at which point there were decisions made by the committee, uh, i.e. recommending to Council. That is currently not the case, so this is just uh, receiving uh, the reports that will be going to Council. Council uh, and There's allowing no informed decision making, but no debate. That's <laughs> indeed the governance structure that the council has approved and has set um, for the, the remaining of the term. Excellent. Thank you, Rudy, for that. Uh, Councillors Sims and Mackey, you are free to leave if you wish, and that will be noted. We have secured the noting in the minutes of the foreshadowing of your conflict of interest. Uh, I'll leave that up to you, but we're not going to entertain uh, this matter any further. Um, Staying put. No, I think we will leave the okay, room, please. given there's been some concerns. Okay, thanks, thanks you. And Chair, just by way of explanation, in order to absolutely... Sorry, the mic. Group. Apologies. Oh. Oh, it's on. Uh, I just need oh, to... Oh, I see it. Um, uh, th through you, Chair, just in order to absolutely reassure uh, fellow members that they can feel free to ask any questions in relation to that item. Um, in, uh, as Councillor Sim says, an abundance of caution will vacate the room. Okay. Thank you. We'll probably have you back shortly. Are there any other questions relating uh, to 4-4 members? Councillor Martin? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I don't think that's, that worked, Councillor. Uh, can you just hit those two, please? Yeah. Vanessa. Well, do you want me to talk from that one? Um, uh, look, uh, given that um, the council took a very big um, to community programs uh, just a week ago, uh, programs assisting multicultural events, community events and the like, um, and um, uh, in fact effectively cut by giving them one year instead of three years of funding, um, we are in here creating a whole raft of new uh, sponsorships about which I know nothing. I have never heard of uh, the uh, Amongst It Festival. Um, I, I don't understand why we're effectively giving a 40% increase to the Dream Big Festival. I've never heard of metamorphosis, uh, so I'd like to understand something about that and why it's necessary to buy that money. But I also want to understand, because it's not mentioned in the paper, why we're axing funding for these other community organisations like the uh, the Guja Street event, the Guja or Great, I can't remember, uh, the, the car one, and there's also a reference to cutting something at um, the East End, um, uh, quite a few of them. So why are we doing that? Before you answer that, I might ask the CEO to, to wait, or Deputy CEO rather, to weigh in. Oh, are well, you comfortable? Okay, we'll start with the cuts questions. Through the presiding member, um, the Adelaide Rally sponsorship application, um, which is what the Gucci Street Party and the Stand Finale event that you were talking about, was previously the Adelaide Motorsport Festival. So that event included a Victoria Park sprint event, Gucci Street Party, and the Adelaide Rally, which is held out in the regions. Um, last year, the Adelaide Motorsport Festival um, received a cut in state government funding, so they weren't able to deliver the Victoria Park sprint element of the event. So to so they had to scale back the event, and they proposed a second street party in the East End, which incorporated a dynamic vehicle display on Rundle Road, and it was rebranded the Adelaide Rally incorporating the Guja Street Party and East End Finale. Um, this was to be a once-off with the reinstatement of the Victoria Park Sprint planned for 2020. However, due to a recent decision by state government to cease funding altogether, organisers advised that they were no longer in a position to reinstate the Victoria Park Sprint as originally intended. 
So organisers have proposed, again, a Guja Street Party and East End Finale running on consecutive nights, and there's not really any point of difference between the two events, apart from the East End Finale being the finish to the Adelaide Rally, so which is in, held entirely in the regions. So um, the the there's yeah there's no point of difference between the two, and um, the with the absence of the dynamic vehicle display, which is what um, attracted people to the East End Finale, there's not really much distinction between the two events. So that's why we haven't recommended funding. Okay, and uh, the other event that's cancelled that we're not funding. Sorry, I the Adelaide Guitar Festival. Oh, the Guitar Festival, yeah. So the Adelaide Guitar Festival was scheduled to be held this month, um, right through to the beginning of August. But that um, the overarching festival was um, cancelled due to COVID-19. And so organisers submitted an application for um, a scaled back version of the event, which is some workshops to be held in January in the City Library and um, Adelaide Central Market and Royal Adelaide Hospital. So when council has pre previously supported the Guitar Festival, we provided $15,000 funding for the overarching event, which attracted about 19,000 people to the city. And this application, the request was for $35,000. And they're proposing minimal attendees to the city, about three and a half thousand. So this application demonstrated minimal return on investment um, and is probably suit, better suited to Council's arts and culture quick response grants program and also negotiating with those other venues like the Royal Adelaide Women's and Children's for a partnership arrangement there. So the scale of this event, if it was the ordinary Adelaide Guitar Festival in its entirety, it probably would have rated a lot higher, but this scaled back version was the lowest rating application that we received. Okay, that's great, thank you. And uh, in respect of the Dream Big um, Children's Festival, um, that's, if I'm reading it correctly, we're increasing their funding by 20%, is that true? Through the presiding member, they previously, this is a biennial event, yep. so it was previously held in 18-19 financial year and we provided 54,000 in funding and we're recommending 60, for their 2021 event. Okay, and, and for any particular reason? I guess it was just a small increase on um, on previous years. Um, it's the only large scale event held in Adelaide dedicated to connecting children with the arts and the largest children's festival in Australia. So in acknowledgement of that, it was a small increase recommended. Great, and can you just tell me what is amongst it and what are more places? The, the, the Amongst It Festival of Nature is a new 10-day event um, proposed to be held in September. Um, we've not had an event like this before dedicated to connecting people with nature that we've supported through the sponsorship program. So it brings something new to the city of Adelaide and it has the potential to be a lasting event on the festival's events calendar. So while the applicants only requested one year funding to support a pilot, their intention is to run um, this as a recurring festival depending on this year's success. We're having a festival here. <laughs> Thank you. And just um, two questions for the uh, acting CEO. Um, a sum of money is being taken out of this $55,000 for operations purposes. What, what are those purposes? Through the presiding member, that's usually um, to make sure that um, things like banners um, and associated um, infrastructure that we ask our recipients of sponsorship um, sponsored events have, um, and it's the associated cost with supporting that part of the agreements. Okay, and just one final question. There's reference to a what's called a inter Internal Events Festival Sponsorship Program Advisory Panel as the one making all these decisions. Is there a relic member on that panel? Uh, no, there isn't. Thank you. Thank you.
Councillor Donovan. Just a quick one. The, oh, the uh, um, reference to accepting requests from commercial event festival organisers operating on an expected profit basis to be considered for support given their financial viability may be impacted. What would be an example of that? Is, so is that for to contribute to an event or their operating costs? Through the presiding member, that will be um, specifically for an event. So I guess an example of and a commercial event might be a commercial food and wine festival or a commercial music festival. Okay. Thank you. Members, any other questions? If not, thank you, Jackie, and thank you, Paula. We'll now go to four five, review of the Adelaide Parklands Events Management Plan, and um, uh, perhaps maybe or someone, if you could drag in Robert and Greg, please. So I'm going to be more. Excellent. Welcome back, Greg. Welcome back, Rob. We're going to take this one as read members and open it up for questions, comments. Sorry, four, four, five. Come on, once. Twice. Three times. Okay. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you, Noni. Great work. <laughs> <laughs> and you're hanging around. All right, 4 6, New Year's Eve 2020, COVID 19 planning. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, through the chair. I uh, won't ask the elected members to count down from 10. So I'll just jump in and let you know that we've considered seven or more options in relation to how to proceed for 2020 New Year's Eve. And the reporting from the view shows a remodeled event is our recommendation, which shows two sites. Uh, two specific sites, one in our park is normal, one in the Pinky Flat, which enables us to manage the numbers. Mm -hmm. It also shows that we'll fence the event and potentially have a ticketed um, but free process to enable us to work within the numbers depending on COVID-19 restrictions at the time in December 2020. So in re reworking the event, we've ensured that, um, that, that we can meet the COVID-19 requirements within the existing budget and we are looking to undertake a trial hybrid visual entertainment program that includes spectacular lighting and firework display as, as requested by members um, that will be a really fabulous visual experience but noting such entertainment will require an additional fifty thousand dollars which we intend to find through sponsorships and partnerships um, and in the home start are ongoing partners to deliver the fireworks already so we seek partners with to, um, without additional company to other elements of the program. And we believe that the opportunity to say ta 2020 and hello 2021 will be welcomed <laughs> <laughs> by a lot of um, organisations and we hope that some great South Australian companies will join us to help South Australia celebrate. If we're not successful in seeking that amount of funding, we request your consideration to postpone a hybrid element, visual element, um, to go ahead with a display and meet budget. Great. Thank you, Christy. Members, questions? Councillor Martin. Okay, um, by way of uh, uh, background, Chair, um, you'll recall that, oh, by the way, I'm sorry we are scaled back. I mean, I think that's a bit sad because so many thousands of people miss out, and uh, for many families, it's a big event. Um, and I'm sorry that we're having a scale back on the entertainment, children's entertainment, and all of that. Um, but uh, I'm also sorry that we're still contemplating fireworks um, because Councillor Moran and I warned uh, last year that there was a danger in that. I can see Councillor Ho smiling over there. I think he knows what's coming. Um, and, um, it, and it was no matter because we set fire to the riverbank in, in a, um, a fire uh, season. And so I'm wondering whether we can have uh, this year, some kind of code so that I, on the last occasion we were hurtling towards it, the Lord Mayor dug our heels and said, No, we won't postpone it, we're just going to go ahead with it. Um, but
But if we were ever in those circumstances again, where there was a fire tragedy and there was a fire warning, um, it would be nuts to start letting off firecrackers and burning the fire plants again. So can we have some sort of code that says when this fire warning comes, when this danger applies, we will seek to do X and Y instead of getting ourselves in that circumstance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Councillor. First up, um, uh, Claire, if you could please elaborate on, on who makes the decisions around the fireworks. Go ahead. Um, uh, then uh, perhaps Claire or, or Noni, um, you could elaborate on the nature of the incident that occurred there at the Riverbank, um, uh, and then we can address the code. Thank you. Uh, through the chair. Um, so decisions around fireworks um, are made right up to the, you know, almost right up to the moment that um, that we say the fireworks will commence, um, and a lot of um, flexibility is built in around location, around moving people, around making sure that um, fireworks, um, particularly on scorching days, which is often the case um, on New Year's Eve, um, are made, um, and it's actually um, by the appropriate fire services authority that make that decision. It's not the city of Alliance call. Um, in terms of the incident this year, um, I was away, but I know um, I did see some stuff on media and I think um, many did address that over in the year when we talked to some ideas and options around um, alternatives to um, fireworks and um, starting to bring through a bit more of a hybrid approach to how we might bring some colour and delight to the New Year's Eve event. Um, Naomi, did you want to add to that? Through the presiding member, thank you, Claire. Um, yes, Claire is right. The decision to release or not to release the fireworks is um, certainly done in consultation with the correct authorities. Um, as part of our planning, we have the MFS on standby um, with a standard practice, as do all events releasing fireworks. The incident that occurred last year was due to an Member that had um, drifted, if I can use that term, into the dry reeds and was put out within less than a minute and the MFS did not record it as an incident and felt that all of our emergency response planning was uh, more than sufficient and adequate and the uh, fire had been extinguished before they even arrived on site. Thank you. Councillor Moran. I think the point we missed a bit here, um, people had died or suffering, still suffering. Um, it wasn't the matter that we thought we'd burn down Adelaide or the, the Torrance. It was the fact that it was a and it was um, insensitive. And many people were here, it's not my opinion. Um, and it was the Lord Mayor's call. It was a captain's call. Um, excuse, excuse me, Chair. Point of order. Are we indulging advocacy at this point? Because we could all get stuck into... We are flying fry. very, very close to the sun when it comes to debate, and I just encourage members to stick to the content that's in front of us, uh, no, which is based on a decision of council. We're not here to discuss uh, or to debate um, uh, the merit or otherwise of having fireworks. So We've done that. 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 we Discuss the issue. Well, Councillor Moran, you don't have to sit here if you don't wish to. Okay. I just ask that you keep on. And disrespectful is that, Chair? I'm just outlining what you're entitled to and not to do. I'd ask that you keep. I'd ask that you keep on the topic. Of City of Adelaide, and I have the right to question the fact. Us. Well, please so question. You can so question those facts, you Councillor Moran. You were making a okay. philosophical point about having fireworks or not. That none of that content is in the report before us. I ask that you interrogate the report before us, please. No, no, no. Hang on. There's a misunderstanding here. Councillor Moran has the call. She can continue asking questions. Thank you. Um, so the point was not that, um, as you said, that we didn't have everything under control and fire trucks there and uh, some fire and all that. That's in your report. You're missing the point. If that's what you're um, aiming at, what we're asking is that if South Australia is on fire, can we stop the fireworks? Because it was told to us that we couldn't. That it was too late. The money had been spent. Blah blah. Then we watched all the other cities cancel theirs including some large regional cities. So what we want is a date that we can say, hang on, 
to the person that we, we buy the file from, is there a time that we can say we're not going to we're not going to go ahead with that? We'll stop filing or buy the music from. What is that? Something to do with the safety. I think the I think the, the, the point of no, council care council care. Sorry, point of order. That is a, a question that is resolved through politics uh, and policy, and is the preserve of the members to respond to respond to, because it is a, a question about uh, constituents. That is not a, a program. I, I appreciate, I appreciate your point, Jesse, but I'm not. I'm not going to let Anne debate, and I'm gonna, not going to let you debate either. Um, I think actually, primarily, after this question is answered, Councillor Martin, I think primarily the question was around at what point in the contract can we back out. That's my interpretation of that. Um, uh, and if uh, Claire or Noni, if you could answer that one. Um, through the presiding member, um, I would need to review the contract to understand the terms and conditions mm. um, to determine what the final sort of, as we would term it, drop dead date would be to cancel the fireworks and not have a financial implication to council or cancel right up to the last minute and still um, expend the budget. Okay, thank you. Councillor, sorry, Councillor Sims had to go yeah. first. And, and I'll, uh, thank you. Just, just a question um, on the uh, decision making around the fireworks. So, is it the Lord Mayor that makes the decision personally, or is it done externally? I don't think the Lord Mayor makes any operational decisions like that, but Deputy CEO? Acting CEO? Oh, right. oh sorry, I'll turn mine on. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, do you mean the fireworks on the night? Do you mean the decision to include fireworks? Do you mean the decision? Well, the, the decision to proceed, because I remember there was some uh, debate in the lead up, but I can't actually recall who made the. I mean, remember the Lord Mayor saying in the media that it was proceeding, but is that her decision or is it made in consultation with others or how, how does that work? Um, I wasn't here last year. Um, like anything, it would have been done um, administratively. Um, the plans were already in place. Um, you know, I do understand um, there was obviously huge concerns nationally um, around uh, what communities were experiencing across the country. Um, at you know, at some point, I'm sure there could have been a special meeting of council. The council had a different that view to take, yeah. but there was a you know clearly budgeted um, a lot of safety um, and risk concerns. But in terms of actually pulling the um, New Year's Eve event as such, I would, my recommendation would have been a, a council resolution would probably be the best approach to enable that to happen. Thank you. Uh, just, just a question about the contract. I guess one of the things that's playing on my mind at the moment is the COVID-19 situation. And um, looking at what's unfolding in Melbourne, I mean, if we had a situation, if we're not able to have public gatherings, um, at, at the end of the year of any um, size and scale. Is that being worked through in uh, contracts and what um, arrangements or kind of plan B could there be uh, that we could do um, if we're not able to actually have a public concert and event? Is that something that's being considered in, in our planning? Through the chair, thank you for that question. Well, yes, of course, all contracts do have a drop dead date, uh, which will, at that point, we will decide to go ahead with the intent, and by then we would know, based on what, where we think the restriction will be. Um, however, the way we've structured this site with two fenced areas means that we can have some more flexibility around the numbers and around social distancing regulations. And it also, all going well, we raise money to have a hybrid event, which includes a lot of lighting and you know, other elements which we haven't had before, which means an element of the event, which is certainly going to go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Martin. Yeah. yeah, look, just a, a point of clarification, Chair. I mean, the purpose of the committee is certainly discussing the agenda of the reports, but contrary to the assertion of uh, um, Councillor Kira over here, it, it, it's about talking about what's in the report, what's not in it and why that is the case. And if in the process of saying that he feels uncomfortable, um, then I'm sorry. But I want to put a clarification. No, it, 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 uh, it, it, Councillor Kira, we're going to accept Councillor Martin's apology um, and we are going to move on. <laughs> if there are any more, if there are any more questions relating to the content of the report, I will entertain them. I will not entertain a to and fro. Uh,
about committees, what they're here for, and why they're here. Precisely what I'm saying to avoid. Councillor Loran. Councillor Loran, your mic is on, by the way, or Phil's is. Pardon? Councillor Loran? Stop you. We're going to continue. I'm stopping both of you. If there are any further questions on this topic, please come forth now. Oh, Councillor Abraham today. Sorry. Welcome. Oh, I'm Judy Madeleine member. He gets the call. No, I've, I've got no question. Just um, for, for members' benefits, in, in, in case they have not uh, seen the video, which Sounds is why the debate. link. It's a debate. Uh, Councillor no, Sims. No, no, no bear with me. Bear with me. You'll see where I'm going. If you haven't seen the video, uh, I highly recommend that video because I think it actually visualizes the hard work that the team has, uh, has done here. So um, uh, please do have a look at it, especially before uh, uh, next week's meeting, if, if we're going to debate and, and vote on this, because uh, it uh, it speaks volumes. Which, okay, which, which thank you. Thank you, uh, Man. You'll speak when you get the call, Councillor. You had your hand up. Did you have something to contribute? I did. I, I'm confused here. Which team are we talking about? Okay. Didn't have any. Anything to contribute? This is not until and fro, Councillor. I'm more than happy we're, to. Uh, we're going to, 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 to highlight that the wonderful team here who's just oh, done the work. Oh, yeah. And uh, and that that was going to be my closing remark as well. Um, I just wanted to thank you for all the wonderful work you've done on this. It's a very very uh, a hard thing to pull together in such a short time frame and under the circumstances that everyone's working under. Um, I think the cost that you've uh, landed at is, is, is quite acceptable and I hope there will be substantial interest for that. Um, uh, and I hope that uh, this can be the beginning of an ongoing uh, tradition and, and way that we celebrate. And um, I think you put on an excellent show. Thank you. Members, we are going to move to 47, which is the wildlife rescue facility in the parklands. Uh, and we welcome Maria Zoni. Straight to questions and uh, comments, members. Speeches. Uh, more a comment, really, just to thank you for the um, the work. I thought it was very um, comprehensive. Uh, you know, a few things that uh, leapt out to me. Um, the uh, the fact that the proposal would cost five to ten million dollars. Um, $75,000 per koala. Um, <laughs> so, so it is an expensive proposal. Um, but no, I, I appreciated the work, so thank you. Councillor Martin. Just a couple of questions. I noticed that uh, 34, the director of Cleveland Wildlife Park, says that 20 koalas would denude the parklands in a matter of a few months. Can we have an idea of how many trees we'll need to plant on a rotating basis to feed uh, those 20 koalas? Is it sort of, you know, replace them every year or um, every 18 months? Or will we truck it in, truck in the, uh, the leaves? Maria? Through the chair. Um, generally with koalas, a koala will eat a thousand um, trees in its lifetime. So um, we were told by experts that it's 50 trees a year per koala. What Clearland does is they have three different sites where they coppice trees to provide um, the feed stock or the browse for the amount of koalas they have. So it really depends on the amount of koalas that would be in the facility in the parklands. But uh, it's a thousand trees per koala is the general um, guide to go on. And within the parklands at the moment, we had a look at what trees would be available at the moment for the, the koalas, and there was a percentage, I think it was, um, I'll give you the exact number, 9,859 potential trees, browse trees for the koalas, and the majority of those were river red gums and blue gums. So koalas are pretty fussy eaters, they only, there's only six species of trees in the parklands that they eat. So if we've got 9,000 trees and we had 20 koalas, they'd last six months. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the, um, without doing the maths, that's the... That's it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, we, we will have a chance to debate this in the chamber, won't we, Chair? Of course. Oh, thank you.
members? I think I might just make a, a couple of comments. Um, and those comments are mainly uh, to highlight that um, I think there's a lot of great information in the report, and I'm very appreciative of that. Um, however, it's not really what was asked for. What was asked for is how uh, we could partner with a private group to see something work in the parklands. Um, uh, it's 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 nice and all to note, you know, five to ten million dollar cost, seventy five thousand dollar per koala um, per year on Cleveland figures. But then we've gone on to list. Koala Rescue SA, Marine Mammals, Minton Farm, Fauna Rescue, RSPCA, Native Animal Network, um, AKR, Southern Koala Rescue, 1300 Koalas. Do you have any information that suggests that they are also forking out $75,000 per year per koala? Through the chair, we, we went to the experts and asked them for this information. So that was the, the um, price guide that we were given based on koalas. Um, I've, I've, I've looked at the regulatory requirements and the guidelines for keeping koalas and they are quite prescriptive and complex so that might be part of it um, but that's that's not information we have in terms of the cost of um, looking after particular types of and birds. And what were these experts, where are these experts from? So it's the Director of Cleveland, um, mm -hmm. the, um, vet, the vet veterinary from Cleveland and the International Centre for Koala Excellence. We also went to Adelaide Koala Rescue and spoke to the team that were looking after the koalas um, and they reflected some of the costs that we um, spoke to them about um, and said that it was an expensive exercise. And what Councillors, we'll have silence please while the answer has been delivered. What, what Adelaide your hand, Koala Councillor. Rescue do is um, generally in a normal situation, the carers would care for those um, koalas in their homes and the, and the prices um, for medicine and looking after um, the koalas, I didn't put them in the report, but they were significant per koala. Mm. Um, and that's that's donations that allow that to occur. Um, in this situation, because of the emergency with the bushfires, they would have to scale up and find a facility. So it's a different scenario. The Cleveland data was based on having a, um, a wildlife rescue operation which is a bit different to what Adelaide Koala Rescue generally do. Right, and so I'm, I'm curious, in your in your investigations, how um, do you think that these uh, not-for-profits um, operate under, under that basis then? Are they, are they bringing in tens of millions of dollars a year to foot this 75,000 per koala per year? Um, so from my understanding, I, I can't give you a, a definite answer, but what Adelaide Koala Rescue and um, other experts we spoke to um, told us was that generally it's in home care so you'll have volunteers who will look after say koala in their house for a short period of time mm -hmm. so um, what happened with the bushfires was, was that you had situations where you needed respirators and ongoing care over a longer period of time um, which is not the norm the norm is you're looking after a, um, a koala um, for a shorter period of time or it depends on the the age of the koala as well um, and so the guidelines actually set out how you do that and what's required so it is an expensive exercise um, right and so these volunteers they must be spending tens of thousands of dollars in home then uh, i can find that on? information out for you that that seems to reflect what we said yeah right um and so um you went to cleveland yeah. did you engage any of these other ngos as well can you speak to them we directly. Just, we just spoke to the and um, the international Excellence and Adelaide Water Rescue. Right, um, and therein lies a bit of a bit of the concern. Um, uh, consequently, funnily enough, there is a lot of koala politics um, uh, around, and uh, everyone has their patch, not dissimilar to koalas actually. Um, uh, and so, in engaging. Um, only Cleveland. I'm a little bit concerned that they, that may have distorted um, uh, uh, the results, and I'm concerned that uh, the report has been entirely and solely influenced by one institution, um, uh, and we haven't actually sought gathering information from other institutions. Um, not least of all, as well, the intent of the motion, um, as I read it and as I know because I put it, um, uh, was that we're not going to be paying for a koala sanctuary. 
we're not going to be forking out operational expenditure <laughs> for a koala sanctuary. Um, we are, we are, this is, this, yeah. this, this is not, this is not, you are doing exactly what you're not supposed to do. You're attacking the report. Councillor Moran, Councillor Moran, you will be quiet or you will leave. I will not be leaving. Councillor Moran. Be quiet. Councillor Moran. Stop this interrogation now. No. Councillor Moran, please behave yourself. I beg your pardon. Please behave yourself. Please behave yourself. This is the last yourself. time I'm going to ask you. Please, uh, Councillor. No, well, okay, I'll keep talking and then I'll see what you do. Because this is untenable. You are being offensive. Councillors, we can actually have a motion in committee to eject a member from the chamber. I'm willing to entertain one. Uh, if you think this behaviour is disruptive. Move it. Yeah, I'll move. We'll leave it for a sec. We seem okay. Um, Maria, yeah, as we no, were no, saying... You are being rude. Moved by, by Councillor Abraham today. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Jesse, come on. Nothing. May, may I make a, a point of clarification here, at least, that might smooth You may passage. request clarification. Uh, might smooth passage. Um, I think it's important that we uh, clarify the difference between uh, advocacy on the one hand uh, and robust questioning of the administration, which as a councillor, I expect uh, and want to have unimpeded uh, during these, these uh, committee meetings. Councillor Sims. Councillor Sims, please. I think uh, Councillor Kieran's uh, comment has identified actually the problem with this new uh, structure. We're not going to entertain well, to and fro on the structure. Well, no, 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 it's, we're it, not. Well, it's actually relevant. Entertain your motion to throw an elected councillor out. And you I'm happy to entertain it if that okay. councillor is going to act in contempt of the orders under stop. which we operate. I could just no, stop. 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 Councillor Kira, Councillor Moran, if you want to debate, you can both take it outside. And stop it, not this time. Could, could I actually just finish my point? Councillor Sims, yes. Thank you. What, what I was going to point out, Chair, is of course it's your right to uh, ask questions. However, I do think in the style of your questioning, you are moving into the terrain of debate. And I suspect if other members of council would. I'm happy to take your point, Councillor you Sims. You however, pull, pull us up. So I'm just I am the chair. I'm, I've been the only chair during this committee structure, so I'm very, very well versed yeah, in how but, it but, operates. But you, you, I'm just letting you know that there could be a perception you're applying a slightly different standard to your um, questioning. So I apply higher standards mind. to my own comments. Oh, of course. But, oh, okay. of course. but thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Maria, but for uh, the monumental interruptions, which would not be suffered by anyone else um, in this chamber. Um, uh, as I was saying, I'm concerned that um, we've derogated from what the intent of the motion was. The intent of the motion was for us to simply say, um, uh, we know that this is an important issue. Um, uh, the NGOs do it quite well. Yes, we've got Cleland over here as well. We have the parklands, we have hundreds and hundreds of hectares of space. Um, if we were to cordon off a patch of dirt, um, would someone be interested in taking care of koalas inside the parklands? And that is not actually addressed anywhere in the report at all. Um, I appreciate um, the very, very, very high regulatory burden um, that's been outlined by the report, and that's absolutely fair enough. We will only want the best care for rescued wildlife. But yeah, I'm just a little bit concerned um, that we've only gone to Cleveland, who would in all likelihood see the establishment as something else that takes care of these animals as in competition with them, particularly because they are the only government provider of this service and we are the only other government that has expressed any sort of interest in, um, in not providing the service but uh, facilitating it in such a way that would make it easy for it to occur here in the metropolitan area. Um, uh, and that's um, that's just my, a bit of my concern going in here. So um, unless you've got any other further information about other engagements that you've done with the sector or what have you, um, uh, that will remain my concern up to the meeting. Was, was there anything else yeah, in that the regard? Other, the other engagement was with government. So we spoke to the Director of National Parks and Wildlife who also um, echoed what Cleland had said with that there wasn't a need for a facility because the other wildlife and then sorry, I also spoke to the director of 
National Park and Wildlife and the Species Ecologist, um, who looks at a lot of the permitting for rescue animals. Um, and their advice was that there wasn't actually a need for a facility because of the other um, uh, existing wildlife rescue facilities are able to scale up um, and look after wildlife at this time. Um, we did speak to Adelaide Koala Rescue about what a facility would look like, and I have I have asked um, Simon Zapier on a couple of occasions um, to provide the model. Um, they were working with Woods Baggett, with Alice Sankster from Woods Baggett, to come up with a design for a um, pop up koala enclosure. Um, and so for this report, um, this is before COVID, and we've also contacted him more recently. We wanted to know what a, an enclosure would look like, the enclosure that he was proposing and the costings for it, but he hasn't provided that to us, so we've only been able to use the Cleveland data. Okay, understood. Councillor Noel? Yeah, just to follow up from the conversation, I suppose, but I suppose if there are a number of organisations and not non-profits, et cetera, that are in this space, um, you know, just if we have, uh, if they're identified, so if we ask the question, then if we had the facilities for which they can do something, then uh, leave it to them, make a determination whether something like that is of interest or, or useful in the context of each of them, because that's what you're actually after, is just finding out. So I think if we do that, then you'll have a very clear answer by the time we come to the committee or to the, to the actual council meeting and uh, be able to guide us with a sort of understanding what we want to do. Councillor Moran. Uh, yes. The mic, please, Councillor. Yeah. Uh, could you read your original motion out then? Because it's news to me that you asked for us to look at private things, private people in the park lands is rather an anathema to this uh, council. Could you read your original motion out? No, you have it right there in front of you and you have well, your reading glasses on. I have faith in your ability to read. Well, I, I can't find the motion. I've said in the discussion notes that the Adelaide Koala, oh, hang on, where have I heard? Oh, it seeks to facilitate the establishment of a small community run facility in the park lands that may be used for rescue, treatment, rehabilitation of koalas and also other local rescue wildlife. So, what you expected from this report has been given to you. It was a stupid idea, but a very good report. Let it go. Members? Any other contributions? I'll just have a second bite of the cherry. Um, uh, Maria, who who's responsible for accrediting and regulating the and the non-government organisations, the volunteer-run organisations that take care of the wildlife? So that's actually the um, it's under the National Parks and Wildlife Act and also the Animal Welfare Act. So that's administered by the Minister of Environment and Water um, and through the Department for Environment and Heritage. So that's why I spoke to the Director of National Parks and Wildlife and staff. And so there's a fauna permit. Councillors, this is not a classroom. There's, there's a fauna, fauna permits unit in the department that goes through rescue permits and, and audits um, those who obtain rescue permits. And there's a whole process yeah. that people go through. Um, but they work with the species ecologist in, in relation to those processes to get advice. So it's a, it's a departmental process, so it's state government that runs it. Yeah, and so presumably I'm guessing that all of the all of the private organisations listed in the report, they have some sort of accreditation or permit, what have you, as will, as will all of their volunteers. Yes, you, 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 need, you need a permit, you need a, um, a permission to hold a British an animal under South Australian law. I don't want to talk about this any longer, but it's just it's gone on too long, and I think the whole point, point has been missed. And I, I want to, the report's great, thank you. Um, but I think I, I, when I voted for this initially in chamber, I was thinking because I went to visit the um, Adelaide Water Rescue, and they have got a uh, had a temporary facility at the time. And they were looking for a space and they were looking in the parklands to be able to, you know, rehabilitate the commerce and also to actually, you know, have a space for them to in the parklands for people to visit in the tourist perspective. I voted for this at the time in chamber for the, for this to happen, because for this to be investigated. And and I was under the assumption as well that it would be under a private company, not actually one by the council, because I don't think this is something that we need to enter into. We, I think we're all in agreement with that. 
Um, so I guess we'll leave it for uh, council to see where we go in that direction. But I think the whole concept of the idea of having a wildlife sector in the parklands is a great idea. Um, it's not a terrible idea. It will attract tourists. You've got people coming here for a conference for two days. It would be a great opportunity for them to be able to, you know, spend some time in the city. And I guess that's the whole idea is what the um, Adelaide Rescue people were looking at as well. Um, and, you know, that's where we could have built it. That's where we were thinking, what I was thinking at the time when I voted for this, that we could build it there. But we'll just wait for this in the chamber. But the report is great. Thank you. I can understand where you were coming from and what you were looking at. Um, but you know, I think we're all thinking different things at the time. Thank you, Councillor Kuros. Councillor Martin. I just wonder whether Councillor Kuros has read the report. Yeah. I have read the report, but I'm saying it wasn't in the notion of the offer of what I'm saying about it Anyway. Just seems to respond to yeah. it. Were there any other questions? Um, Thank you. Yes. Okay. Quick. Is this too much to bear? I mean, this is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Uh, we'll move to 4.8 and I'm going to take it as read. Is there any questions on the electrification of vehicles? You Members? No? Excellent. Thanks. Excellent. Good work. Uh, we now come to five, exclusion of the public. Five, one. We have two items for consideration and confidence. A 6 1 Whitmore Square apartment and 6 2 review of the exclusion permit decisions. Uh, we do this separate, don't we? Uh, I'll seek a mover and a second to 6 1 Whitmore Square apartments. Councillor Abraham today, seconded by Councillor Noel. Members? Councillor Mark. Again, Chair, uh, this is not something that should be in confidence. It is a matter uh, concerning um, uh, a, uh, a public matter. I don't think that we published exactly what it is. Whitmore it is, Square, what's it called? It is titled Whitmore Square Apartments. Therefore, uh, the residents of the Whitmore Square Apartments know that this council is discussing their residences tonight. They will not know what we're discussing. They will be naturally concerned about their own environment, where they're living, whether they have tenure, because if you see your residence on a council agenda, it is a matter of concern. And we're going to go into confidence now. Uh, it is far more open, far more collaborative to have this discussion in public rather than behind closed doors. Now, I know, and I can see Tom moving into the chair over there, that he's going to tell us exactly why this needs to be heard in confidence. Um, can we take that as read, by the way? I do know what the arguments will be. But, yeah. Well, if we're just running through the motions, Council, there's no need to repeat it. So please it's, a, it's not a commercial matter. It is a matter of people's residences, and it should be heard. Councillor Abraham, today. Thanks, Chair. Um, can administration uh, give us a uh, uh, I guess, um, provide us with some clarification why this is being discussed in confidence. Just quickly picking up what Councillor Martin said. Um, uh, effectively, it is before you. However, what we're dealing with is uh, three different options in regards to rent. And how that has the impact in regards to it not only talks to Whitmore Square, but actually talks to affordable housing as you move through, because you will be dealing with this as we progress through our apartments. The, the reason why it's confidential is we deal with all our lease matters, all our rental matters in confidence. And to respond in regards to Whitmore Square, the, the tenants are fully aware that the decision is required. Are fully aware that we will be discussing this in confidence. The reason being is they know that NRAS effectively finishes at a certain period. Thank you. Excellent answer. Thank you, Tom. Members? Councillor Abraham, today, sum up. Sum up. Put that to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. I'll seek a mover and a seconder for six. To review of e-scooter permit decisions. Councillor Abraham today, Councillor Ho, Councillor Abraham today, do you wish to speak? No. Councillor Ho, Councillor Martin. Um, again, this 
this matter uh, has been the subject of much public discussion. Uh, indeed, um, the, uh, the whole matter was reported fulsomely in the media through much of December, January, February and March. Uh, and the, uh, the title reveals to anyone that is what has been published on the agenda exactly what this is about. Now, I understand that there will be an argument that the publication of the legal report accompanying could be prejudicial uh, to the council's interests, but there is no reason why uh, an expurgated version of that uh, can't be published along with the papers as well. Thank you. I'll ask Rudy or Brett um, to weigh in on that and please um, furnish us with the date that it will become public. When? It will. Including the legal report. Read your papers. Through the presiding member, if you read the uh, resolution sought in regards to the exclusion of the public and the resolution and confidentiality order, it does indeed talk about what's remaining in confidence and what will be published immediately after the decision has been made. So that is to say, that is to say, there will be an expurgated version published. Through the presiding member, the attachment A will be made public. The attachment B will remain in confidence on the basis of legal professional privilege in accordance with the legal advice provided to us by Kane Lawyers. So um, my question remains, it is our intention to publish it. Why wouldn't we allow an ex expurgated version to be dealt with in public at this time? Through the chair, when Kane Lawyers has considered the appropriate way to divulge any outcome of this review, they have prepared, as subject to your consideration, a document that summarises the conclusions, findings and recommendations to be released to the public. They deem that that is an appropriate pitch and tone for public dissemination following council's consideration. Attachment B, which provides the full details of the review, contains sensitive information and legally professional privileged information that they themselves have recommended should be retained in confidence due to the sensitivity and the risk that, that could expose council in the event that there were proceedings against council. Um, it is reasonable for us as administration to act on that professional advice. We didn't provide input, we did not influence the legal professional providers in coming up with that conclusion. Um, look, there's a misunderstanding, Chair, of what I'm asking. Why are, why are we not presenting in open hearing the matters which will be published? I'm not suggesting that uh, attachment B, the more detailed report, is made public. I am suggesting that only that matters, uh, those matters which Council intends to publish anyway, why are they not in the public realm now? My understanding of that, Councillor, is that and throughout the course of discussion on these matters, we may wish to refer to the advice which is client and confidence. Um, uh, and if we were to exclude that and segregate that into another in confidence session, that would actually greatly diminish uh, the substance at the point where it was almost fruitless having it. That's my read of it. Was there anything you wish to add, Rudy? And that's correct through the presiding member indeed it's also protecting the members here present because otherwise there's no point of discussing it because you may inadvertently breach. or breach your confidentiality requirements so it's to enable informed decision making fully aligned with the guiding principles so for you to enable to be to enable you to fully um, debate it when it goes to council and uh, and all ask questions tonight during the uh, uh, committee i i repeat there is no reason why you can't have those two discussions, one in public, one, one in private. Nothing I have said, nothing that has been said would not allow that to happen. It's, it's just a further example of us putting things into secrecy when we can put large amounts of information into the public realm. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Any other contributions? None. We'll go back to Councillor Abraham today to sum up. Put that to the vote, those in favour. Is against. That is carried.